Hi, now that we familiarize ourselves with the ISL MVP model, we can use it to analyze the impact uh, of fiscal and monetary policy under different exchange regime and under some additional assumptions that we are going to discuss. But before we go there, one more thing. Look, over here we have ISLM BP equations. Now, we're going to start with flexible exchange rates and monetary expansion. But for now, let's focus on this a lot. Look, if we have uh, if we have a flexible exchange rate purely, it means that central bank is not intervening in uh, uh, in currency market. So uh, there is one thing here now that is unnecessary. This is the change in the level of foreign reserves. We are assuming that the central bank is allowing the currency to fluctuate as much as it needs to. Okay, so this is what we've got, and now we will be considering different cases. So we've got we're gonna start with monetary expansion. Okay, but we need to before we start, we need to make one additional assumption. Look we are going to assume that there are no restrictions on current account, but we will assume different levels of a uh, different degree of restriction on capital account. And uh, let's start with the case when there's no capital mobility. So basically speaking, in this, in this scenario, capital cannot move freely between domestic economy and the rest of the world. So we're going to start with no capital mobility. Okay. In this case, ISLM BP model looks like that. Ice curve, here we've got Allen curve, and finally here we have BP curve. Okay, look, the details about the slope and, uh, uh, and positioning of BP curve you can get uh, from the links in the uh, under previous video uh, but we're not going to focus on it I just want to draw you draw attention to one thing over here look if uh, BP if our currency depreciates BP curve moves to the right and if it if it appreciates it moves to the left well it will change what will we change the slope of BP curve and Actually, the slope of the BP curve is the thing that determines the uh, degree of capital mobility. Well, technically speaking, this is a, some form of an interplay between LM and BP. But let's assume that LM and IS are given. We, are, we cannot influence them uh, at all. Okay, so we're starting also with this case because I believe it's the easiest one. Oh. Uh, they're all fairly easy. And look, we will go through different degrees of capital mobility. Why? I, I believe it's going to become self-evident to you once we go through more and more cases. Okay, so look, at the beginning we have an equi equilibrium with interest rate I zero and level of income 
y is zero. Okay, so at this moment, market for goods and services, money market, and exchange rate market are all in equilibrium. Okay, so now we are analyzing the effects of monetary expansion. So first thing that is happening over here is that central bank is increasing money supply. How do we see it? Uh, how do we see it on the model? Look, of course, just like in closed economy, we need to shift LM to the right. And look, what does it do? Let's for focus for now only in what is happening in the closed economy. Higher interest rate, uh, I'm sorry, uh, higher money supply induces lower interest rate, right? Higher money supply, the same demand, lower interest rate. Uh, uh, lower interest rate stimulates investment as investment being part of aggregated expenditures they are causing increase in GDP. Okay, and look, this is the first part. Let's call this first part what happens in the closed economy. But now we need to take into consideration what happens uh, in the uh, uh, in, in the open economy. Okay, and let's see what is happening over here. Look, first, if GDP increases, well, that influences current account, right? How? Well, it creates higher demand for foreign goods, so higher imports, so current account, trade balance, is going into deficit. And look, if current account is going uh, 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 is going into deficit, what is this going? Uh, uh, how is that going to affect our exchange rate? Well, let's think about it. Look, if we are purchasing now more. Uh, uh, and the level of purchases in our economy stays the same. So export stays the same, but imports go up. It means we need to purchase more of foreign currency. There is a higher demand for foreign currency, so its relative price is becoming uh, bigger. Well, it, it increases. So we observe a pressure on depreciation. We need to pay more units of our currency for one unit of foreign currency. Okay, now, current account is not the only thing that could be affected, right? Because also interest rate is low, but because we do not have any capital mobility, capital account, in this case, is basically dead. Well, it's not affecting anything because there is no trade in assets between home and the rest of the world. So actually, this is the only thing that happens. But look, if a current, if our currency depreciates, it means our goods are becoming more competitive. If our goods are becoming more competitive, current accounts improves, right? Because it needs to, remember, for now, this part doesn't exist, this needs to close at zero. So, if current account improves, this means GDP must go up. Okay, and look, when GDP on the other hand, is going up, we'll notice that this, of course, will induce higher money demand, 
and with higher money demand, we should expect higher interest rate. Okay, and this is the chain of causality here that I'm going to here denote with a green color. And look, this is what happens in the open economy. So this is purely a closed economy effect. This is the open economy effect. Higher GDP creates a current account deficit, which puts a pressure on depreciation. Depreciation is, um, uh, uh, is actually uh, in improving current account. Improvement in current account increases GDP, which of course leads to increase in interest rate through money demand. Now, how do we see this on the graph? Look, current account is part of ice, right? And we do not see S over here and over here. So it, it, it's exogenous here. So again, if, if our currency depreciates, it means that other things being equal, we will have higher interest rates uh, a, a higher incomes for given interest rates. So, uh, yes. Is moving to that right and finally because our currency depreciated we need to move not only is but we also need to move BP and what do we see on this graph what well, we see that what happened in our economy is that GDP actually increased while interest rate has decreased. Of course, here we can imagine a situation where interest rate does not change at all. Well, here it depends on the rel relative slopes of LM and IS, but let's just say that it decreased. Slide. Okay, so what is the main conclusion we can get out of it? Look, GDP, if this was a closed economy, right, that would be GDP in closed economy, right? Just move through a little. But because this created a deficit in current account, which in turn put pressure on depreciation and the adjustment mechanism on current account induced higher GDP because current account improved as a result of depreciation, we see the GDP has actually increased. Okay, so look, we see that monetary policy is effective. It's even more effective in case of flexible exchange rates than in case of closed economy, even though we still have no capital mobility whatsoever. Okay, so what if we're gonna introduce a little capital mobility. Let's consider now a case that we're going to call low capital mobility. Graphically speaking, uh, which I also proved in one of the uh, 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 videos for which you can find links in the previous video, uh, capital mobility depends on the relative slope of BP and LM. As long as BP is steeper than LM, we talk about low capital mobility cases. So now let's introduce this low capital 
Mother. Okay, so. Okay, we got Y here. We got I over here. Zero over here. And I got IS. Two sources 
of pressure on uh, on depreciation. Before we had just one, now we have two. But there is a different question, which now is not that important, but it's going to turn out to be crucial when we're going to discuss fiscal policy. Which of these pressures is high, is stronger? Which of them is higher? And look, this is a case of low capital mobility. So, this is what we're going to think of about defining whether which of these two pressures is stronger. If we have low capital mobility, then the pressure coming from current account is going to be stronger than the pressure that comes from capital account. Look, in this case it's irrelevant, but it's going to become relevant uh, very soon. So let's remember that. Okay, and now look, what is now what we're going to see is that things that are happening. Uh, are going to be very similar to what we observed in the uh, previous example. So, current account as a result of depreciation is going to improve. And as a result, our GDP is going to go uh, is going to go up. And as our GDP goes up, money demand will go up and interest rate will go up. But look, if GDP goes up, this will actually mean that current account will be slowly closing. And because interest rate is going up, it means that capital account is also going to be slowly closing. What is this whole thing that you see over here? Is what happens in the opening line. So, what do we need to change over here? As a result of increase of depreciation of exchange rate, we would observe increase in IS. But actually this would be in a movement of IS by more than here. Let me just, of course remember this graph is not perfect. Okay. So, okay. it goes somewhere over here. And finally, our exchange rate has depreciated, so BP moves to the right. But of course, also by more than here. Why? Because look, now we have two sources of pressure on depreciation. So, and it goes, let's just say, over here. We've got BP. And look, we got new equilibrium. Uh, okay, that's. Okay, I went a little bit overboard. Everything is fine, but I went a little bit overboard. I'm sorry with moving IS because interest rates should fall, not uh, not go up, which is impossible. So as is, uh, let's just say that this IS movement is not that bad. IS prime, right? Still too far. Still too far. No, that, that, that's my fault. I probably should have. You know what? I'm gonna just move LM further. It's so let's just say that LM goes like this. Okay. Then we see increase in IS. Okay. It's gonna work. And corresponding movement of BP over here. It's really hard to draw when you're not a computer. Okay, so we've got GDP that is higher, 
and interest rate that is low. So what can we say about effectiveness of monetary policy in this case? Well, the conclusion should go that monetary policy is more effective. What is this second source? Uh, wh why it has become more effective? Because look, now we've got a second source of pressure of depreciation. So our currency depreciates by more and our current account, trade balance, is improving by more and as a result GDP is increasing by more okay <coughs> so we saw that when we introduced capital mobility monetary policy has become even more effective so what about if we increase capital mobility even more. Let's, so now let's consider the situation number three, situation of high capital mobility. Again, uh, we are going to model degree of capital mobility by relative slope of BPMLM. Now, high capital mobility we encounter when BP is flatter than LM. So, the new equilibrium is going to look like that. We are still assuming that IS and LM look exactly the same, even though they might not look like that from my graph. Uh, on my graph, sorry. Okay, and let's just say that this is the BP. Okay, this is LM, IS. Okay, we've got a short run equilibrium at Y0. And again, central bank increases money supply. So, as a result, of course, as before, money supply goes up, uh, interest rate goes down, investment go up, and GDP goes up. This is what happens in a closed economy. This is what we see. But now we know what will it do? What will be the open economy consequences of increasing minus one? Okay. So we will have, of course, our assets are becoming less competitive than us. We, we are seeing capital outflow. So, capital account goes into deficit. This means that we will have pressure on depreciation and, G and because GDP goes up, current account goes into deficit and we have again pressure on depreciation. Well, because both of these forces work in the same direction, we will definitely have depreciation of the currency. But now, which of these forces is stronger? We've got high capital mobility. And look, that is the key. Difference between low and high capital mobility is that, dog, that not before, current account was dominating balance of payment. 
No capital account is dominating bonds of payments. So actually now pressure from capital account is the dominating one. And look, pressure on current account is the same. Pressure on capital account is stronger, which means that the, the, in this case, depreciation is even bigger than in the previous case. But of course, the consequences are the same. Current account improves, GDP goes up. As a result, a, a money demand goes up and interest rate goes up. A higher GDP creates a pressure on closing current account, while higher interest rate creates a pressure on closing capital account. So, again, this is what happens in the open economy. How will we see it over here? Well, in a very similar manner as before, we need to move. Ah, too much, too much, too much. I'm very enthusiastic about moving IS, as you can see, but probably this is too much. Well, definitely. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, IS moves somewhere here, and and of course BP also moves to the right as a result of depreciation of that currency and we see that GDP has increased while interest rate has gone down and look, what can we say in comparison in, of these two cases? Because here and here, pressure from current account is the same, but pressure from current capital account here is lower than here, we see that the effect of depreciation must be stronger. Here we have bigger depreciation, and as a result, GDP increases by more. So, what this example, is, how, how should I comment this example, where monetary policy is even more effective. this done, let's get to the case number four. And case number four is perfect capital mobility. So now we have no restrictions on capital flows whatsoever. We can say that they are basically perfect substitutes of assets from two countries and from, so from, uh, from our whole economy and the rest of the world. The only difference is, can be between them, is the interest rate. Uh, okay, so we've got now perfect capital mobile. So, we are making a graph, again, assuming that IS and LM look exactly the same. The only thing different, of course, is going to be the slope of BP. If capital mobility is perfect now, we will have a situation where interest rates in two countries must be the same. But you just said, but I just said that the only difference between them can be interest rate. Well, it can be for a very, very short period of time. But, in this case, instantly, through, uh, through capital flows, this difference is going to be 
Medicaid. How? You're gonna see in a second. Okay, so look, now the V curve. So we've got IS, I've got LM, and this line is perfectly flat. Even if I didn't do it properly. Okay, here we've got our interest rate that is exactly equal to word interest rate. Here is equilibrium GDP. Okay, again, we start by central bank increasing money supply. So this is what we observe. What we observe in a closed economy? We observe that money supply go well, maybe I'm gonna start here. Yeah, money supply goes up and this causes drop in interest rate, which induces investment and higher GDP. Closing You see here would be our GDP and interest rate in the open, uh, in, I'm sorry, in a closed economy. But of course, this has open economy consequences. So, what happens over here? Look, we'll know the capital account goes into deficit, right? Our assets are less uh, competitive than assets from the rest of the world, they bring lower rate of return. So this creates a pressure on depreciation. Remember, because now our resident wants to buy more of foreign currency to buy foreign assets. Here we again see that higher imports are uh, bringing a deficit in current account. which again creates pressure on depreciation. Which of those pressures are, is stronger? Well, definitely this one. In case of perfect capital mobility, capital account completely dominates pressure from current account. But of course, in this case, it doesn't make any difference as they both lead in the same direction. And I hope you see that we will have now the same chain of causality here. Current account improves. As a result, GDP improves. As a result, money demand increases. As a result, interest rate goes up. When GDP increases, current account starts closing. When interest rate goes up, capital account starts closing. Now, how will we see this open economy effect on the graph? Well, all we need to do is to move IS to this location. With the same interest rate, but higher GDP. And look, because here again we have the same pressures on depreciation from current account, but yet this pressure on depreciation from capital account is stronger than this one, we expect that the monetary policy is going to be even more effective. So, we can say in this case that monetary policy is the most effective. Okay, so 
Now we've considered all the cases. So what should be the general conclusion from that? Look, the main conclusion is that monetary policy is effective in affecting, of course, GDP in the short run, regardless of the degree of capital mobility. It's always more effective in open economy than in the closed economy. However, the higher is the degree of capital mobility, the stronger is the end effect of monetary policy. Now, at home, as an exercise, please do exactly what I did over here, but for monetary contraction. So, draw a graph, make a proper movement, go through the chains of causality over here. Okay, thank you for your attention. In the next video, we're gonna go through fiscal policy under flexible exchange rates.